We continue from our previous tutorial in which we proved the Frobenius rule that states uh, that the uh, conjunctions and existentials commute with each other. Uh, let's try the dual Frobenius rule in which exists is replaced with for all conjunction in, and conjunction is replaced with disjunction. So maybe Koch can do this one as well. So we go, we try first order and we're stuck. In fact first order proved the implication from right to left and it's now telling us that what's left is to the proof of um, left to right because H here this is the left hand side of the equivalence and this is the right hand side of the equivalence. The reason why Koch doesn't do this is that the proof of this requires classical reasoning but Koch is an intuitionistic theorem prover so whenever you want to prove something classically with Koch you have to tell it explicitly that you allow classical reasoning that is to say you allow the law of excluded middle so we have to say that. Now there are various ways to do this and I'm just going to define what the law of excluded middle is. It's for all p, p or not p. Notice how I did not tell Koch that p is a proposition. It can calculate that by itself um, because it sees that p is part of a disjunction, so it has to be a proposition. In fact, we can check this with print lem, and you see it says for all p a prop. It computed that p is a prop. Let me also define Frobenius like this. Frobenius is the statement that for all of these guys this thing here holds. So now we can't just prove Frobenius, we're going to prove that lem implies Frobenius. Now if we try first order it's completely stuck, it doesn't do anything because we first have to unfold the definitions. So I say unfold Frobenius and Lem and then do first order. We're still where we were before, we're proving the direction from left to right, but now we have the additional assumption H. So how do we proceed? Well, we are trying to prove a disjunction here. The canonical way to prove a disjunction is to either prove the left hands, the left disjunct or the right disjunct, which in Koch you do like this. So if, if I wanted to prove the left one, I would say left, and then it says, okay, prove the left one. But I can't do it directly like this. I have to use the law of exclu excluded middle, and I have to use it for a particular instance. It turns out the instance I should consider is Q. So now I want to say, use the assumption H, plug in Q for P. How do you do that? So I do it like this, I say assert, assert a special case of H and call it G, let G be the special case H of Q. Think of the for all statement as a function which accepts a P and then it returns this thing. So I'm applying H to Q. So now I get Q or not Q. And now I want to use G. So how do I use G? I use G by considering two cases, what happens if Q holds and what happens if not Q holds. And the way to do that is to use destruct. I say destruct G, like this. And now my proof will divide into two sub-branches. See, I have two sub-branches. This step of assert followed by destruct is very common, and in fact you don't have to do it like this. You can immediately say destruct H of Q. So this says, take H, apply it to Q, you're going to get Q or not Q, and then destruct that, use that. And Koch knows that the way to use a disjunction is to branch the proof out into sub, two subproofs. So now it's easy. The first branch says, prove Q or this for all, but we have Q as an assumption, so we say we're going to prove the left disjunct, which is an assumption, like that. Now the right one, let's see, how do we prove this one? Um, sorry, the other branch. The other branch gives us the assumption that Q doesn't hold and we still have to prove the same disjunct. Now we're going to prove the right one. We're now proving a for all statement. A for all statement is always proved, almost always proved, by first doing an intro so that this for all XA becomes 
goes up into the context. So now we have an x and we have to prove p of x. How are we going to do this? The only thing we haven't used yet is the h0 assumption. Uh, we should apply it. We should apply it to our particular x and we know what to do. So as before we say use h0 applied to x. So the way to do that is to say destruct h0 applied to x. And let's see what will happen. H0 applied to x is this disjunction, q or p of x. So the proof will again, it will fall apart into two subproofs, each of which needs to be proved, like this. So the first one is prove p of x using the stuff up here. But notice how I have here h1, which is not q, and I have h2, which is q. So I have not q and q. I have a contradiction, and from contradiction anything follows. And the way to tell cock that this is what I'm doing is I'm saying eliminate h1. So eliminate this one. So cock says, aha, you're trying to prove p of x. And you, the way you're going to do this is, since you know not q holds, is you're going to show that q holds. It says, yes, okay, you can do this, but you have to show that q holds, which it does. It's an assumption. So I say, well, this is an assumption. And the other branch, well, the other branch I have to prove p of x, but I have it as an assumption, so I say assumption. Uh, assumption. There we go, we proved it. Whenever you prove anything like this, you should think, well, can I do it in a better way? Of course we could, because this is a rather slow proof, we could, for example, instead of doing all this business here by hand, like this, we could use more, power, more powerful tactics. So what I could do, for example, is here, here, I just give it the hint, I say, use h of q, and then you will get two branches, and for each of them, use first order, like this. Okay, so when you have a semicolon, this means do this thing here, and then for every sub goal that you get, do this thing here. And first order, hopefully, we hope it's going to take care of everything or maybe most of it. And it does. So that's a slightly better proof now. Here's an exercise for you. It turns out that the Frobenius rule implies lem. Can you prove this? So this is not an easy exercise, I warn you. Um, let me unfold like this. And maybe you try first order. So I will leave this tutorial at this point and in the next one I will show you the proof of this fact. Um, because you will see some unusual uses of intuitionistic sets.